Hey, well, um, <clears throat> this message this morning is one I've given before, but I, I'm thinking about giving it every um, year, uh, not out of laziness, but just out of necessity. It's one on hospitality, showing hospitality, building a loving Christian community, and that's a part of our purpose here at GBC. The B in GBC is building authentic Christian community. And that's what we want to be doing. And a great way to do that is through hospitality. So I, I, as we move in towards the end of this year, I know it's super busy. You've got every kind of breakup under the sun, right? Jammed, packed between November and December. And, um, but as you're moving towards next year, to be having these things in your mind um, and how you're going to plan it out for next year. So we're just going to go to a whole variety of scriptures. And so be ready to, to flick through that. And if you're taking notes, which I'm sure you are taking notes, some of you take notes on your phone. Just press that little note tab. Uh, some of you write it down in a, in, a, in a diary. I don't think I'm being facetious, but um, if you're taking notes, there'll be a, um, I'll give you the headings as we go through. So there's no no PowerPoint today. You know, when you read through Scripture, it defines or describes the church using different metaphors, right? You remember in a, a Corinthians three verse nine, if you remember this, Paul describes the church as a field, right? And we are the produce of that field. In that same chapter, in the following verse, he also describes the church as a building where the foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ and we are the the stones being built upon that. Ephesians chapter 22, perhaps taking uh, it more specific in regards to a building, the church is described as a temple because we are the dwelling place of God by his Holy Spirit, right? And Ephesians 4.12 also describes the church as the body, of which Christ is what? He is the head. He is the head of the church. But my favorite metaphor is that of a family. It's that, is that of a family. Ephesians 1 says that we are adopted as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. We are children of God. We have received the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of adoption. We have been adopted as sons. Uh, God is our Heavenly Father. And it's one of the things when Christ came and ministered, that's what he did, especially when you read through the Sermon on the Mount, how the Lord called uh, God his Father and, and also example for us, the kind of relationship we ought to have with him. He is a loving Heavenly Father. And so that's how we address him. And in First Timothy 4.14, 4, it describes this as being the household of God. And so as a family, we are to love one another. The Apostle John makes this clear in 1 John chapter 5. You can turn there with me. He says, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And you remember the reason why they're not burdensome is because God has written them on our heart. When he gave us the Holy Spirit, who renewed our hearts, therefore we delight and we love the law of God. We love to obey God. But notice what John says about loving one another. It, again, consists of keeping God's commands. And so love has an objective standard. It is the supreme example, as we've heard, what Kerry was talking about, and the love of Christ where he laid down his life for us. That's a supreme, extended example of love. A love that gives of oneself in order to do good to another. But that good is defined by what God says is good in his word. It is defined by what God wills, by what God commands in his word. And so one such command that we're given is to show hospitality to one another. And so when you read through these verses, these passages in Scripture which contain this command to show hospitality, they reveal that it's an important part of, of the family of God. That showing hospitality is an important part in our day-to-day life, in our relationships. Is that a hucker? Um. Firstly, eldership, uh, uh, hospitality qualifies someone for eldership, right? It's a qualification of eldership. An elder is to be hospitable. 
Hospitality characterizes those widows who are to be honored in 1 Timothy 5. When Paul speaks about the church supporting widows who are widows indeed, they have no uh, family to support them. The church is then to support them. But they are those whose life is, has been characterized by showing hospitality to the saints. You see that uh, showing hospitality expresses practical love for fellow believers. It enables evangelism. People inviting other believers into their home to hear the gospel, to speak to them about Christ. The call and Priscilla did that, remember, to... Um, I can't remember his name now. It's just escaped me. Apollos. When he was preaching the way, and he didn't quite know it quite clearly, and so they brought him into the house and explained to him more accurately concerning Christ. And we see there then hospitality aids discipleship and builds fellowship. Hospitality and the modeling of hospitality are essential to the Christian life. They are essential to the Christian life. And I want to show you this morning again, as I have previously, that hospitality is a key factor in building a loving Christian community. I mean, in this church, we've got long standing members who have been here for, for many decades. But we've also got new families, new believers who are coming in, and we want to get to know each other, right? We want to get to know the saints who are older and, and who have walked with Christ a long time. And there's an, an enjoyment in hearing about how they follow Christ and the, and the trials that they've been through and the joys that they've had. And it's also in, in exciting to listen to the, the believers that come into the church, the new families, and to listen to how God saved them, to hear how God has redeemed them and, and what they have, what's gone through in their lives. And it's exciting to listen to them and you begin to rejoice to see God's work in their heart, even as it has been at work in your own heart. And so we want to grow in our affection for one another. And a way that we can do this is, be buying, is by being hospitable. And so you can see then that the responsibility of this isn't just on the few, even though elders would be hospitable. It's not just for the few. It's a responsibility for all, for, for every believer in the church. And it isn't a matter of giftedness, but it's a matter of obedience, obeying what our Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, has called us to do for the sake of the building up of the body. So, taking all these scriptures together, there's just three points to hang our thoughts on as we go through them. So again, if you've got your pen and paper or you've got your phone, um, I'll give you them one by one as we go through it. So here's the first one. Hospitality is a practical way to show love. Okay, Hospitality is a very, 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 very practical way to show love. And you see that, we'll see that in a number of verses. If you look with me in Romans... As we go through these verses, you're going to see that in almost every command to show hospitality, it's always in the context of showing love towards one another. So in Romans chapter 12, verse 13, Paul says, contributing to the needs of the saints, he exhorts us to practice hospitality. But at the beginning of the chapter, you remember, we, we read it this morning, Paul urges us not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but instead to be transformed through the renewing of our minds. And this transformation obviously involves becoming more like Christ in his love for us and for one another. And so in verse 9 of chapter 12, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. That's Christ, right? Christ hated wickedness. He loved righteousness. And then he says, there be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And following on from this, you have that exhortation then to practice hospitality. In verse 13. And then look at with me in First Peter chapter 4. In verse 9. There he says, Be hospitable to one another without complaint. But this follows on the heels of verse 8. Look with me there. Paul says, In fact, look at verse 7. He says, The, all, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound mind and sober judgment for the purpose of prayer. That's important. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. So there you, again, you see, and this exhortation to believers to love one another is this command to be hospitable to one another. And then look with me in Hebrews. Turn back with me to Hebrews chapter 13.
verse 1. He says, let love of the brethren continue. Let love of the brethren continue. And this word continue carries the idea of persist. You are to persist in loving one another. And straight after that, he says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. And you also see it in, in John's epistles, um, when, when people used to go out preaching the gospel, they relied on the hospitality of the saints to, to care for them and to look after them while they were out preaching the gospel of God. And so oftentimes they may not know that person, but they would have a recommendation from a church or from an apostle. And so they would show love to them. And so looking at these two verses, looking at these verses, there are two words here that is used to describe love for one another. The first is the term agape, and you, you know that one in Romans 12 and 1 Peter, that's the word, the word agape. It's a sacrificial love of God that was demonstrated to us in Christ. Romans 5, 8. For God demonstrates his love for us, and that while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so you understand from that, again, we talked about what love is. It's it's the giving of yourself and doing good to others as God defines good. It has nothing to do with the object of the one you loved. You don't love them because of something they do for you. You don't love them because of something beautiful or, or, or marvelous about them. That's not why God loved us. We were sinners. We were at enmity with God. We were hostile to God. We were unbelieving. We were engaged in hostile deeds, evil deeds. And yet God in that state loved us. It had everything to do with the character of God had everything to do with his mercy, his grace, his kindness, his benevolence, his desire to redeem, his delight to love sinners and to save them. And so that's the same kind of love we're to have towards one another. It's not because we deserve it. It's because we're called to be like Christ in our love for one another. So we love. But then there's a second word, um, Philadelphia. And that we see that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. And this is an interesting word. This is a familial love. This is a family love. So this is the love that you would have for your family members, right? Your, your spouse, your children, your brothers, your sisters. Hopefully your brothers and sisters. Um, but it's the love that you have within a family. And again, because we are the family of God, we are to have this kind of love for one another, this familiar love, this family love, this genuine affection for each other, care and concern for one another, to want to see each other grow and to be like Christ, loving one another not as how we think we should love one another, but how God calls us to love one another. And so we've seen throughout that that our love is to be without hypocrisy. We're to be genuine and sincere in our care for one another. We're to be devoted to one another in brotherly love, caring for each other's needs, even as the body has rallied around and, and cared for my family, is, even as they have, I know, for many others who have, who have been injured or hurt or in sickness or in bereavement have cared for them. We're to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. We're to be fervent in our love for one another. We don't let up. We don't let up in our love for one another. We try not to wane. We ask God for the grace to just be consistent in how we care for one another. It says we are to persist in our love for one another. And we also to grow in our love for one another. Look with me in Second Peter chapter 1, where you see both these words, agape and Philadelphia, together. In Second Peter chapter 1, Remember, he's talking about the fact that having been saved, um, having been given everything you need for life and godliness through Christ, through our knowledge of him, and that God has granted to us in verse 4 um, his precious and magnificent promises that we might become partakers of the divine nature, again, children of God, having received the Holy Spirit. And in verse 5, he says, Now for this reason, applying all diligence... In your faith, supply moral excellence, and your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, familial affection, family love, and in your brotherly kindness, love, self-sacrificial giving of yourself for the benefit of others. And so this we are to grow in and where to persist in, and where to pursue, and a practical and tangible way that we can do that is by showing hospitality to one another. Because it 
It's all of those things. It is love in action. It's both personal and it's sacrificial. You give up your privacy to open your home and your family to invite others in. Uh, you give of your time in preparation for your guests as well as hosting them in your home. You give of your finances because it costs to have someone share a meal with you or to stay at your home. And so you give of yourself, your time, your money when you show hospitality and these are real demonstrations of love. And then when you have them in your home, you get to know them, don't you? Personally, you get to know them. And Lord willing, you begin to develop a, a, a family affection as you recognize that this one is one for whom Christ died, like me, a sinner like me. And so you recognize Christ's love for them, and because they're your brother or your sister in Christ, you love them, because you love the one who loves them, who saved them. As one author noted, um, Hardly anything, quote, sorry, hardly anything is more characteristic of Christian love than hospitality. Through the ministry of hospitality, we share the things we value most, family, home, financial resources, food, privacy, and time. In other words, we share our lives, end quote. It's fellowship, isn't it? Sharing our lives with one another as we follow Christ together. 1 John 3, 16, 17, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? So showing hospitality is a practical way to show love. And your home is the ideal place in which to build relationships. Uh, and the closeness in relationships. As I said, hospitality helps build that loving Christian community. Well, that's the first point. The second is this. Hospitality is a proactive way to serve in ministry. Okay? Hospitality is a practical way or proactive way to serve in ministry. As we went through those verses, we saw that it was always in the context of love. We're also going to see that the call to be hospitable to one another is also in the context of exercising your spiritual giftedness. So look again with me at Romans chapter 12. You see that verse there in 13? That's the one we looked at, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. But in that chapter, of, uh, chapter 12, verse 6, Paul says this, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to each, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if serving in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so Paul is saying here that these gifts are to be exercised not for our own sake, remember, but for the sake of others. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. God has given you a gift, but it's not for your own benefit. It's for the benefit of others. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. You can turn there with me. And Paul writes, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And so you recognize God has given you a spiritual gift that is necessary to be exercised in the church in order for the church to grow, to mature, to become more like Christ. We see a very similar thing in 1 Peter 4. Come back there again with me. Remembering the context, Paul is saying that the end of all things is near in verse 7. Be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Keep fervent in your love for one another. Be hospitable to one another. In verse 10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Verse 11, 
Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so again, we see how hospitality is closely linked, not only with loving one another, but with the exercise of our spiritual giftedness. So then we think, well, how is that going to practically outwork? Because when we think about it on a Sunday morning, we only gather for about an hour and a half. If the preacher doesn't go too long. But we're only here for an hour and a half, right? And it's a, it's a very small window of time. And so we, often when we think of serving or we think of exercising our gifts, and I don't know whether this is a, a hangover from Open Brethren days, because I grew up in an Open Brethren church. But we think of exercising our giftedness on a Sunday morning. It's preaching or teaching, maybe in the worship service, maybe in a Sunday school. Um, we think of serving maybe in the music, uh, maybe on the sound and data, the guys at the top there. Without them, this, this doesn't happen. Um, people may be welcoming people into the church, the morning tea. And all of that is, is important to help with fellowship. But we often think of, of ministry in those terms on a Sunday morning. Or perhaps we think of our giftedness as being exercised in in what I call formal ministries, those, those structured ministries of the church, youth ministry or, or in the Sunday school, more than craft, home groups, those outreaches where, where people are reaching out into the community and you think, oh, my gift needs to be exercised there. But even then, that might only be for an hour of the week. Right? And so there is only so many of these positions you can fill, you can be involved in. But you can't leave your gift dormant. Your gift has to be exercised if the body is to grow. And so you need to look for other ways in which you can exercise the gift that God has given you for the benefit of others, for the benefit of other people in the church. And the answer then is hospitality. That is a great way for you to exercise the giftedness that God has given you to benefit the church. It's what I call informal ministries or you're developing ministering relationships. Ministry is happening not so much in, in, in structures of the church, but it's happening in the context of your own home. As you invite people in to, to share a meal or to stay the night, and you're caring for them. It's a way in which you can exercise your, your giftedness to benefit those believers in Christ as you sit down and talk and encourage one another and share what you've been learning and ask them how they've been and praying for one another. And this is where the work of service can be done in building up the body of Christ, Ephesians 4.12. Alexander Strauch gives some great counsel when he writes this, quote, Perhaps you, like many Christians, want to know what you can do for the Lord or how to use your spiritual gift. Your home is the ideal place in which to start serving. You can invite people into your home for prayer. You can reach out to new people at church or in your neighborhood. You can help believers get to know one another better. You can provide lodging for divided families. You can show appreciation to teachers and your leaders by inviting them into your home. You can be the home away from home for singles living on college campuses or serving in the military who may not have eaten a home-cooked meal in weeks or months. Many people need the ministry of hospitality, end quote. That's just so true. And so showing hospitality is, is a practical way that we can show love to one another. It's a proactive way to serve and exercise your spiritual gift in ministry, focusing on the relationships that you have, and when we do this, as a result, the body of Christ is going to be built up. We are going to grow, and our affection and our love for one another will increase. Well, here's a third point, and there are helpful insights on hospitality. As we go through these verses, just want to look at some of these helpful insights on hospitality. Um, and this is from what Scripture says, but also what many of you would recognize as you've practiced hospitality in the church for many years. You'll recognize these. The first is this. Husbands, for those of you who are husbands, and we'll see this again, everyone's responsible for hospitality, um, even when you're single. But I just want to talk to the husbands. It's your responsibility to lead your family in hospitality. 
It's your responsibility to lead your family in hospitality. If hospitality is, is not occurring in your home, you need to realize that it's your responsibility. You need to lead it. You need to lead it. We see that from 1 Timothy 3 2. One of the qualifications to be an elder is that the elder is to be hospitable. Again, the implication being that he's leading his family in that. Now, obviously, the husband and wife work together. Hospitality at my house would consist of maybe baked beans, spaghetti, <laughs> cheese on toast. I can make a mean cheese on toast, quite flavorsome. Um, it, you know, but without my wife, hospitality would happen, it just wouldn't be as rich. Um, but obviously, the wife and husband work together, but the husband, you need to lead it. You need to lead it. You need to, to, to talk with your wife about how you can show hospitality, how regular, how, what's realistic. Um, also, if you have young families, I can tell you showing hospitality is a fantastic way uh, to witness and to show your children your love for the church. I mean, how much does Christ mean to you And when you try to explain it to your children, but, but when you have the saints in your home and you're praying for them and caring for them, your children see your love for the church. They know you love the people of God because you love God. And so you want your children to see that. Not only that, they get to serve alongside their parents. They get to uh, uh, serve, do dishes, set the table. You know, they get to make the, set the table or clear the table. Um, they might play with the children if you're bringing a family along and the kids can play with their kids. The kids will learn hospitality. They'll learn how to serve others as they watch you do it in the home, caring for people. They'll see, again, the genuineness of your love and faith. So that's the first one. Husbands, you need to lead your families in that or else it's not going to happen. Second point, second helpful hint is you have to plan hospitality. You have to plan it. Hey, Romans 12, 13, practice hospitality. The practice means to pursue, to seek earnestly. Um, Hebrews 12, do not neglect to show hospitality, which is something it's easy to do, isn't it? Listen, if you leave it to Sunday morning, and some of you could do this, but if you leave it to Sunday morning, you might not be ready to host somebody, or you might go to church and we'll just ask whoever's there and you can't get anyone to come to church. But you know, if, if you say, listen, let's have someone this Sunday for ch from church in our home and we'll ring them up this week and ask them, then when things turn haywire at the end of the week, you can't back out, right? You still have to show hospitality and you have to ask God's grace, help me not to grumble and complain and say, why, why did I invite this person home for lunch? I could really use a rest. God's sovereign in that. You can trust him. He'll give you the grace. And you might find that it may just be what you need. You may have the intention of ministering to them, but the, the family that come, don't be surprised if they end up ministering to you and you come away refreshed and encouraged and thinking, Lord, I'm so glad that we didn't cancel last minute. But you have to plan hospitality. Proverbs 13.4, I, I love this verse. Um, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat. You can have all the desires in the world, but unless you actually do something about them, they'll just remain desires. So you need to plan. You need to schedule a regular time. Once a week, once a fortnight, once a month, however you do it, just plan it. To get past the good intention and to the level of actually doing it. And in that way, again, you will be a hearer, a doer of God's word and not merely a hearer. And I think this is something that does escape us. It's, it's, I mean, for God to command us to show hospitality once is enough, right? But it's more than once in his word God commands it. And so it's very easy for us just to let that command slip by us. But we ought not to. If God's repeated it, it's for a reason. And so we don't want to let that command escape us. So you have to plan hospitality. Second, our third hint, you have to pray about hospitality. In 1 Peter 4, 9, be hospitable with one another, uh, to one another without complaint. I think the biggest enemy to show hospitality outside of busyness is, is selfishness, right? We're, we're prone to it. 
Actually, you could probably throw pride in there because sometimes we don't want to open up our home to people because maybe we don't want them to see what we're like in our home. Right? But we're just trying to be genuine. And if we all understand that we're all growing to be more like Christ, we're not going to be judging one another in that way, just appreciative of the love that's been shown to us. Um, so we don't want to complain about hospitality, and so we need God's grace to have that right attitude, and it is a spiritual attitude. Philippians 2, 3-4, remember Paul says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So, again, it's, it's a spiritual discipline. It requires a spiritual reality of humility, of considering others above yourself. It's being like Christ. So you need to pray about it. Fourth, make, hospi- make hospitality about ministry. Make it about ministry. Have a, have a reason and a purpose why you're inviting people over. You want to get to know them. How can you pray for them? Is there a way that you can serve them? You can help them, aid them. Um, invite new people to the church. New people in the church, invite them over for a meal. Or even new people in the church, invite other people in the church to get to know them. Have those in your home who are going through a tough time to be able to pray for them and minister to them. Um, those who are um, single, young adults, widows, widowers, have them in your home and minister to them in that way. Again, just you're looking to get to know people. And, and by the way, single people, again, you're not exempt from this either. You, you can show hospitality as well. Inviting a family over or other young people over into your home. You could have a potluck meal if you have the coronary school, uh, the, the uh, catering schools as I do you can just have a potluck meal and get people to share and you can provide the drink and bread whatever it is but yeah you're just, just looking again to minister to people if you're new here at GBC and I know there are some new families here or you're relatively new you want to get to know people in the church you're looking for ways to serve in the church show hospitality you'll do both not only will you get to know people, but you'll be able to exercise your gift in, in serving people. And again, when it comes to evangelism, your home is the perfect place to share the gospel with people. It's the perfect place. Because they'll see you, they'll see you in your home, they'll see you with your family. Um, so bring your workmates, your neighbors, other families into your home. When we think of those ministries here more than craft, mainly music, play group, I know that it does happen. You can invite those people into your home and get to know them as an extension outside of that ministry. They provide the opportunity to meet these couples and then you want to get to know the families outside of that and so you can share the gospel with them. And lastly, well, the last tip is, is just make hospitality simple. It is about the ministry. It isn't so much about the food. It's about building the relationships. So, I mean, we grew up, probably a lot of you are like this, we grew up, mum, we had a, a, hospitality was great at my place, I need to say that because my mum is here, but it was actually great, I'm not just saying that. Mum and dad were great at showing hospitality. You could go to their place and just relax and rest and talk and some people would be weary and they'd lie down on the couch and sleep. Um, but growing up, we used to have great meals, but, but it doesn't have to be that. It can just be very, very simple. It could just be sandwiches. Because again, it's about the relationships. It's not so much about the meal. But listen, if you're great at that and you love doing that, then man, put on a banquet. But uh, And you will bless people with that. Look, in his book, uh, The Hospitality, Command, um, Hospitality Commands, and, and by the way, we'll, we'll get some more in, but when we have a, a newcomer's lunch, we normally give one of these books to, to the new families. But in this book, Alexander Strauch describes hospitality as the missing jewel in the crown of Christian life and service. The missing jewel in the crown of Christian life and service. I've never been to a church where this was missing. Maybe it needed a little polishing, but it was never missing. We can't underestimate the vital role that hospitality plays in building a loving Christian community. 
in being a loving Christian church. It was a prominent feature in the early church because that's where they would meet to worship the Lord in each other's homes. First Thessalonians, Paul, uh, First Thessalonians 14, Paul urged the believers to excel still more in their love for one another. And even though I know many here practice ex- uh, hospitality, there's just an ex- exhortation, can we do it more? Can we excel still more? Can we sh- ex- um, extend ourselves, stretch ourselves in loving one another and getting to know one another, the new families, the older families, and just really building that Christian community that reflects the love of Christ so that all the world may see that we are what? Truly disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. And Father, we thank that you are the most hospitable of all. For Lord, you do not only welcome friends, but you welcome sinners and make them your friends through Jesus Christ. You take enemies and you welcome them into your home. Those who, who deserve judgment and wrath, and yet, Lord, through Christ, you have made us children of God. And, Lord, we are part of your household. And so we thank you, Lord, for the love that you have shown to us. And just pray for us as a church that we would look for ways that we can grow in our love for one another. We, we do love one another and we acknowledge, Lord, and thank you for the grace at work in us to do this. And we just pray that we might look each one to ourselves to see how can I grow in this? How can I grow in hospitality in loving others and ministering to others in my home? And so, Father, we just commit this to you and trust that as we obey you as we do what you've called us to do uh, that Lord your word would prosper not only in maturing us but in seeing others come to faith in Christ Father we pray uh, for your glory in Jesus name Amen